Hi everyone, Reese here, and welcome to another episode of Control Alt Reese. In this one, I'm going to be taking a look at this, the Atari Video Music, which is an interesting piece of hi fi equipment which was released in 1977. Yes, you heard me right. This isn't actually a computer or a games console, as you would expect from Atari, but a piece of home entertainment equipment. So I'm going to be telling a little bit about its story, I'm going to be explaining how it works, and as you can probably see, mine's also in need of some restoration, so I'm going to tackle that too. Finally, in what I believe to be a world first based on my research, I'm also going to be adding an S video output to it so I can get the best possible video quality from it. Photosensitive epilepsy warning. Parts of this video include some fast strobing effects and bright colours. I will try to keep these to a minimum, but I hope that you understand that these are necessary to show how the unit works. So first, a quick history lesson. In the 1970s, hippie counterculture ruled at Atari in stark contrast to their boring corporate Silicon Valley neighbours like IBM and Intel, which inevitably ended up attracting budding young engineers who shared this mindset. Atari was infamous for its so-called company retreats, or weekend long drink and drug fueled hot tub parties, which spawned many of their innovative early game and hardware concepts. It was during one of these retreats that the video music idea came about, and due to the company's pre-existing relationship with American department store giant Sears, who were not only one of the biggest names in hi-fi and TV retail, but had also been selling their own telegames branded OEM Pong consoles since 1975, they had the perfect retail outlet. The concept was for a machine that could be connected to a hi-fi amplifier and a TV, and in a world first, it would use an integrated circuit to generate brightly coloured patterns on the TV screen synchronised to the music. In keeping with the hi-fi aesthetic of the time, it would feature lots of brushed metal, black vinyl, wood, and brown and orange buttons. The device was developed under the codename Project Mood by the Atari engineer Bob Brown, who had previously been responsible for the home versions of Pong. Bob Brown had designed video music, our weirdest product ever. Hook it up to your stereo and TV at the same time, and the sound triggered some pretty psychedelic visuals. The Sears guys took one look and asked what we'd been smoking when we did that. Naturally, one of our techs lit up a joint and showed them. Despite that initial reaction, Sears took Atari up on their idea and put the video music up for sale in their stores in late 1977 for $169.95, or around $750 or £570 in today's money. I can't find any historical sales figures, but as it was on sale for less than a year and is a relative rarity today, it's probably safe to class this one as a commercial failure. Incidentally, at the time of the video music's development in 1976 and 77, Brown was also working on the VCS, with which the video music shares some electrical similarities, particularly in the way that the video output is generated. So the aim with my video music is a restoration and also a modernisation. I want to be able to retain the original looks and functionality, and ultimately I want to actually use this thing, but in its original form that's not entirely practical for me. For a start, being American and dating from the 1970s, it outputs an NTSC RF video signal, which is the same as TV broadcasts at the time. Unfortunately, there isn't much on this side of the pond that can actually display that kind of signal, and even in its homeland, those old TVs are rapidly dying out. Of course, by adding S-Video, I'll get a much crisper and clearer signal from it anyway, which could then be fed into something like a RetroTINK and upscaled for display on a modern HDMI TV. The other thing I want to address is the power supply. Of course, the one that came with this is a US 120 volt unit, and it's also been very badly repaired by a previous owner. I'm planning to address the power supply in part two, as the way this works is unusual, and I'd like to go into a lot more depth on that subject. In the second part, I'll also give a full demo of the video music's functionality and features. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. First things first, just taking a look around the outside of the unit, we can see that the 1970s design aesthetic is in full effect, with lots of brushed steel and those lovely orange and brown buttons. I'll give a demo of these in part two. We can also see that vinyl effect top and those walnut effect melamine side panels, which are looking very much worse for wear after 40 plus years, so I'll need to address those. Taking a look at the back, we see the audio inputs. Incidentally, it's supposedly very dangerous to plug anything into these without first connecting the power supply to ground everything, so if you own a video music, please do bear that in mind. Here we have that very compact 120 volt power supply. Oh, and finally, here's where the RF TV cable originally connected. It seems a previous owner has cut this off, but still included it with my unit, not that I'm going to be reinstating it anyway. So to get our first glimpse inside, we just need to remove these three bolts that attach the lid. As they're not standard screws, I'm not sure I have the correct tool for this, so I think I'll have to improvise. 
Wait, no, it turns out I do have one after all. Now the lid is off, we can have a poke around inside. First up, we have five potentiometers connected by a ribbon cable, and underneath those, some lovely chunky switches. In the power supply section, there are two rather substantial axial capacitors, which it would appear from the schematic are actually decoupling caps. I'm not sure why they need to be so big. Here we have another potentiometer, which I believe is used to fine tune the clock frequency. And finally, the IC that basically handles absolutely everything. This custom chip, designed in-house by Atari and manufactured by American Microsystems, or AMI, is interesting in that it used NMOS, or N-type metal oxide semiconductor logic, an old chip technology that we don't even have the capability to manufacture anymore. It's also a very strange one in that it runs on completely different voltages to modern ICs, and that's something I'll cover in much more detail in the next video. Finally, there's the RF modulator, which takes the video output from the chip and turns it into a signal that can be displayed on a standard TV. Atari have helpfully included four very big and obvious links that carry these signals, and this is where I'll tap in to pick them up for my S-Video mod. Now it's time to carefully dismantle the unit and remove the motherboard. Removing the buttons without damaging them is a very fiddly business, and was by far the longest part of the teardown. The buttons clip over the ends of the switches, and as the 40 year old plastic is likely to be very brittle, I had to proceed with caution. I eventually came up with a method that involved gently levering the clip apart by pulling the button, and I'm pleased to report that all 13 of them survived completely undamaged. I've seen plenty of these for sale with missing buttons, so I'm very happy with that result. As you can see, the buttons are absolutely filthy, so I gave them a good scrub in some soapy water along with some of the other parts. Now it's just a case of removing the motherboard and front panel, and I can finally remove those side panels which just attach using self-tapping Phillips screws. I think these panels are actually beyond help, as all of the edging is coming off and one of them is badly warped like it's been dropped at some point. I decided to ask my Twitter followers whether replacing these with real walnut would be appropriate, and the response was pretty much unanimous, so I decided to at least give it a try. Of course, like all my other mods, I'll be keeping the original part so it can be put back at a later date should it not work out or I change my mind. I've never really done any kind of small scale woodwork like this before, but I decided the first course of action would be to transfer all of the holes over, which I measured and drilled. After test fitting the sides to make sure the holes are in the right place, I give them a quick once over with some fine grit sandpaper, using a sanding block to keep it flat. I decided to use this Ron Seal Warnup varnish, and although it was purple when I first applied it, which was very confusing, it actually dried okay and the colour and finish ended up being very close to the original fake Warnup, so that's a great result. With the varnish drying in the garage, I turned my attention to actually getting a video signal out of this thing. When I first got my hands on it, I cobbled together a proof of concept circuit based on a schematic I found on Twitter, posted by a user called Paul Ricards a few years back. Of course, with the presence of the separate Luma and Chroma signals, the temptation was very strong to keep those separate rather than combining them into a composite output, so I gave it a go and it worked very well.
If you're following along at home, this is the point where I should warn you against copying this circuit. Yes, it works very well, and with a small improvement I'll go into in a minute, the picture quality can be improved even further. But as Paul warns in his original Twitter thread, the output levels are all over the place and well out of spec for S video, and there is a risk of damaging whatever you hook it up to, as well as the video music itself. I'd actually embraced my inner artist on this one and freeform soldered it rather than prototyping it on a breadboard like I usually would. So with a known working solution as a starting point, I decided to transfer the circuit to perfboard. Once the circuit was assembled, I fitted the S-Video socket into the hole where the RF cable originally was. It involved drilling two small holes for the screws which I have to admit I wasn't keen about, but it'll give the tidiest end result. Then I stuck the board to the back panel using some double sided adhesive foam pads. Now that the board is installed, I'll need a way to connect it to the motherboard. Thankfully, as I mentioned earlier, Atari made the video signals coming from the chip very easily accessible by using these metal links. The links carry the sync, chroma and luma signals, as well as a ground. In my early prototype I hooked into these using crocodile clips, but I came up with the idea of fitting some pins and using DuPont connectors, which I think is very much in the spirit of how everything else connects in here, and will allow me to swap the board out easily later as I refine the circuit. As always, the metal links will be stored alongside any other removed parts in case I need them later. As these have been in a long time, I'll apply some brand new solder and a liberal coating of flux before desoldering to minimise the risk of damage to the solder pads. I cut the individual pins from a pin header strip and used some capped on tape to hold them in place for soldering. Even though this is marketed as no clean flux, I still like to remove any residue with some IPA. Incidentally, after this part was filmed, I went back and reinstated the original links between the IC and the RF modulator, using wire links underneath the board this time. It means that the RF output can still be used in future if desired, and I decided that maintaining that interaction between the two parts was probably important to the correct functioning of the hardware. So now it's just a case of reassembling the bare minimum needed for a test and crimping on those DuPont plugs.
As per Paul's original tweet, I also found that the video output was pretty washed out compared to some footage of the original RF output that I'd seen online. Hooking things up to an oscilloscope confirmed my suspicions that the signal was wildly out of spec, but my main concern was the peak-to-peak -peak voltage on the Luma pin, which also carries the sync signal. I managed to bring this down a bit by adding a 100 ohm pull-down resistor, which not only improved the contrast of the colours but also the stability of the picture. This is a great start of course, but I think I'm going to experiment with incorporating some resistor dividers into the circuit to try to get these signals more into spec, and for that I'll need a nice stable power supply. Until that point I'm working on the assumption that running this for any length of time may cause some damage. That said, both my CRT and my RetroTink seem quite happy with the signals. And so I think that's a good point to end part 1 of this restoration and modification. Join me in part 2 when I'll be looking at the power supply situation, making those improvements to the S-Video circuit, and of course finally putting this thing back together. And when it is back together, I'll give a complete rundown and demo of all of its functions. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, so you don't miss that. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up. It helps me to improve the visibility of my videos and helps me to grow the channel. If you have any other comments, questions or suggestions, let me know down in the comments section. Finally, I'd just like to thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully see you again next time.